بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربنا الذي أعطى كل شيء خلقه ثم هدى صلوا على محمد وآل محمد So last week we concluded the names of the Quran and the foreign languages in the Quran and the sections of the Quran, that whole section. So now we begin the revelation, the wahi. Because we know that the Quran was revealed upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and there are types of revelation, there are types of wahi and there are also types of guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides individuals in various ways and He also reveals revelations in various ways. So this whole section discusses the wahi, the revelation. Now what is a revelation? The revelation, it's in Arabic, it's derived from the word wahi, waw, ha, ya, wahi, which means a swift, um, fast inf telling of information or delivering a message in a very swi swift way, either through a sign or through a very swift way, telling someone something. This is the wahi according to the linguistic definition and as we mentioned sometimes there's something that we use it we use the linguistic definition and then sometimes the Quran applies other definitions and the definition of that word changes as a result of the the Quranic use for example we mentioned uh, we mentioned last time the word uh, the word dua and the word salah salah was initially a word of supplication but then the Quranic usage it changed the meaning and same with wahi the, the linguistic use is just a swift um, wahi i'lam sari' wa khafi in a secretive in a fast uh, swift telling of delivering a message this is what it means according to the linguistic definition however there are other definitions there are four definitions of wahi and four usages of wahi that are all used in the Quran. You find that the discrete signal, which is the linguistic definition, this is mentioned in several verses in the Quran. One of those verses is when Prophet Zakaria alayhi salam, he leaves the mihrab. He comes out of the mihrab after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed him that he is going to have a son. So Allah says in the Quran, فَخَرَجَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ مِنَ الْمِحْرَابِ فَأَوْحَىٰ إِلَيْهِمْ أَنْ سَبِّحُوا بُكْرَةً وَعَشِيَّةً He left the mihrab after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had just informed him that you're going to be a father. At an old age, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him you're going to be a father. So he leaves the mihrab, فَأَوْحَىٰ إِلَيْهِمْ He does a wahi to his people. Of course, wahi has different meanings. Sometimes it's from God and sometimes it's a signal. He signals to them and sabbihu bukratan wa ashiyah. He signals to them because he was fasting. He was not, he was fasting from words. He was not speaking. So he signals to them, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has just seen a miracle. He has just seen something that is very great in his eyes. So he tells them, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this scholars say that this usage, fa'awha ilayhim, this is using the, the grammatical linguistic definition of wahi or awha. And then there is another type of usage and that is at tarkiz al-gharizi wal-fitri. Wahi, sometimes it also refers to the instinct, the human nature and the instincts of human or animals, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has programmed us. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has programmed each human being in a way. 
the animals, they're programmed in a way. Why, how do animals know that they live in this way and not in a, according to a different lifestyle? This is all the program of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has programmed any, everyone in that way. And this is the fitrah. This is the fitri. This is the, the innate subconscious that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us all in. He has given us this guidance. It's not through a wahi. We don't have a revelation coming down, a messenger, an angel coming down upon us, but we all act in a specific way. This is the fitrah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there's another type of wahi, and that is the ilham in nafsi, where sometimes you feel there is, there is this feeling where Allah subhanahu or someone is telling you to do something. You have, this, you have this feeling. It doesn't have to do with human nature. For example, Allah says in the Quran that we told وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ We brought a wahi upon the mother of Musa to place her son Musa, the newborn baby. Where does she place him? In the basket in the Nile. Now this is not a human, a human instinct. But she just had that gut feeling there. This is a type of wahi, ilham. And we will explain, inshallah, later on, what's the difference between ilham and what's the difference between wahi. But she had that, she had that feeling which orders her and she felt that the only thing she could do right now is just place him in the basket and let him go in the Nile, in the river. Yes, sister. Uh, what's the second type, the nature of the animals? What's, what's the word? This is the fitri, the, the, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created them. And this is the gharizi, which is the instinctive or the natural, the natural way of creation. Yes, sister. Can you just look for me for one more time? Yes, so the first use is the linguistic use. And we see that with the story of Prophet Zakaria alayhi salam. Linguistic use means just signaling to someone in a very discreet, fast way. He wasn't speaking, so he probably signaled with his hands, with his eyes in one way. That is also a type of wahi. The second is the use of wahi with Allah subhanahu And we will, we will mention these, these verses that are in the text. They point these out. And that is through the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. You know, here... وَأَوْحَى رَبُّكَ إِلَى النَّحْلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought down a revelation revealed to the bee saying, build your hives, where? In the mountains and in the trees and in places, in buildings. So who taught the bee to do that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Did Allah send a prophet? Did Allah send a messenger? No. This is the, the natural way where the, the innate subconscious that we have, the fitra. We have the fitra and the animals, they have a type of fitra as well. This is a type of guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided all. The third is the ilham in nafsi, which is the gut feeling that one might have, like the mother of Musa alayhi salam, where she felt that ilham to just place her son in the basket. And the fourth, which is the, the focus of our discussion here, is the wahi rasali and that is the legislative revelation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a revelation upon a prophet to deliver a specific message. And that's the type of revelation that we're going to focus on. But we see that the prophets of Allah, they received the guidance, they received the wahi in several ways. Now, sometimes, for example, Jibra'il, he would come down upon the prophets. Other times, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he would see a fire or he would, see, he would hear sound and he would hear those sounds and it was as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to him. Of course, Allah does not have the, the way to speak like us. Allah does not speak like we do. Allah creates sounds. He creates sounds and Musa would hear those sounds and that's how the, the message would be delivered to Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Sometimes in a dream, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had a dream. That was a type of revelation upon him. And sometimes Jibra'il would come down upon the prophets, like he would come down upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And even Jibra'il, he would come down in several ways. One time he would come down in his angelic form, which according to the hadith, he would cover the whole horizons. The, the whole horizons would be covered when he would come down upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And that happened several times. 
Sometimes, according to narrations, Jibra'il would come down upon the Prophet through the, a human being. And some of the narrations, they say that he would come down with the physical form of one of the best looking men in Medina, a man by the name of Dihya al-Kalbi. He would come down and they would see Rasulullah speaking to this man. Then once he leaves, Rasulullah would tell them, that was Jibra'il. That was Jibra'il with me. And then other times, the revelation, the revelation would come down upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa upon the heart of Rasulullah, directly Allah speaking, Allah speaking directly to the heart of Rasulullah without an intermediary, without Jibra'il. And that is the highest form of uh, revelation and the best form of revelation. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he experienced all of these. But you see that some prophets, they would only experience, for example, a dream. Others, they would just have that, that gut feeling. Each, one, each prophet, they had a different type of revelation that would come down upon them. So the word example would be the Mi'raj? Yes, in the Mi'raj. That is also one when Allah spoke directly to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Now, we go, to the, we go to the text and they begin, we, I, I put the four types of wahi, the four types of revelation. This was brought from another text. Now, the, 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 and of course he will cover this later on as well. But he discusses, the, offer, the, the authors here, they discuss the types of guidance. Because there's also various types of guidance. And sometimes you see that the types of guidance, they fall within the various types of wahi. And so they're, they're intermixed with one another. Sometimes the, the wahi comes in different types of guidance and guidance they come in different types of wahi. So God has guided his creation to attain perfection through two forms of guidance. There's two types of hidayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided people. The first is called Al-Hidayah Taqweeniya and that is the intuitive guidance. And the second is the Hidayah Al-Tashri'iyya and that is the legislative guidance. So these are two types of guidances that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided individuals. Hidayah Taqweeniya and Hidayah Tashri'iyya and these are very important words. Taqweeniya, it means something that has to do with the cone something that has to do with the creation, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way He created us, it, there was built-in guidance, a built-in GPS within every, single, within every single creation. How do the animals, for example, why does, the, why does the chicken follow the chicken and not the duck? You know, this is, this is a built-in guidance. This, is, this all goes back to the fitrah. Why does the bee go and build... Um, uh, the hive in the, in the mountain or in high places, this is built in guidance. Why doesn't it live like other insects or other types of... Uh, this is all the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us. You know, this go, it goes back to the natural, the nature, it goes back to the desires, it goes back to instincts, it goes back to all of, all of these apply. And then there's the Hidayah Tashri'iyah, that is the sending down the message, sending down the Qur'an. This is a type of more specific type of guidance. Now, he's, the, the authors explain the Hidayah al-Taqwiniyya. Hidayah al-Taqwiniyya, which is the intuitive guidance, and it is concerned with the laws of nature that govern the inanimate objects and the natural instincts of animate beings. So the Qur'an states, رَبُّنَا الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. He did the khalq. He created everything and then he guided it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not just create without guidance. Now there's several types of guidance. There's the guidance that we have all been programmed with and then there's another guidance where is, which is extra guidance and that is Allah sends prophets and messengers to guide us, to teach us the ways. But there is a fitri guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way that we have been created, th that is a type of guidance. So some examples of intuitive, which are the instinct, instinctive guidance, appear below, illustrating God's guidance or inspiration to inanimate objects, animals and humans. So this type of guidance, it goes to animals as well. It goes to any, anything that comprehends, and also animals and all of the creation of Allah. For example, even the trees. 
the trees. Isn't there a type of guidance? Why doesn't the tree grow sideways and it grows up? This is all by the creation of Allah, the programming of Allah. Every creation of Allah, it's programmed to be in a specific way. And this is the Hidayat Taqwiniyah. So to the earth, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا بِأَنَّ رَبَّكَ أَوْحَالَهَا On that day, the day of judgment, the earth shall relate its news because your Lord had inspired it. And this is in Surah Al-Zalzal. So the earth, it will, be, it will be able to speak because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed it to do. So, to the bee, وَأَوْحَى رَبُّكَ إِلَى النَّحْلِ أَنِ اتَّخِذِي مِنَ الْجِبَالِ بُيُوتًا وَمِنَ الشَّجَرِ وَمِمَّا يَعْرِشُونَ And your Lord revealed to the bee saying, make hives in the mountains and in the trees and in what they men build. So, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that programmed the bee to go and build hives wherever it sees fit and in these places that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about. To mankind, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ, للدين حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا There is that innate subconscious within every single human being, Muslim or non-Muslim, atheist, whatever, a, a human being, you take that person out of the jungle, there is a program, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has programmed every single creation, including the human beings, Allah has programmed us in a way. Then set your face upright for religion sincerely. This is God's pattern in which He has made men. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has programmed us to worship, has programmed us to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now he says the last verse refers to the natural instinct or the fitrah that exists in every human being and through which he intuitively knows and comprehends certain truths. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has programmed us with this fitrah. I don't need, to, for example, I don't need to go and learn that justice is good and oppression is bad. Every single one of us knows that justice is good, oppression is bad. Hurting other people, we all know that that's bad. No one, no one comes and tries to say that that's a good thing. And this is why you see that those who oppress, those tyrants who oppress, they don't come and say, I'm an oppressor. They come and they say, these people are bad. They try to change the definition. They know that oppression is bad. This is the fitrah of Allah. No two people come and say, no one, you don't find two human beings, one says, yes, oppression is a good thing. No one will say that. Even the, mo the worst and most oppressive person, he will come and say, no, I have the right to oppress these people because for so and such and such reason. So everyone knows good is good and wrong is wrong and this is the fitrah. This is the fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created and this is the, the hidayat taqwiniyah. So the second form of guidance that Allah provides is an external form. So now we talked about the taqwiniyah. Now that is the built-in. Now there's another type of guidance and that is the external guidance. It comes from outside. The external guidance usually through His messengers and divine books. So through the prophets of Allah and through the books, the divine books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This guidance which is reserved for sentient creatures, meaning that the creatures that are able to perceive and understand. Allah does not send prophets and messengers and books to animals. Allah sends them to those who understand. To the sentient creatures like mankind and the jinn is referred to as the legislative guidance. So the human beings and the jinn, they have a legislative, the, the hidayah tashri'iyah, the legislative guidance. And this form of guidance is necessary because while man instinctively knows good from evil, he does not know the full consequences of his conduct. He needs a goal to aim for and a model to base his life on. This is the role of the prophets and this is the role of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So we know good is good and bad is bad, but sometimes people confuse how to get to that route. People know that they need to worship, but sometimes they get lost and they say, okay, I need to worship, but they go and they build an idol and they worship an idol. So every, see, this is why you see most people worship. Even those who don't worship God, they go and they create something to worship because there's an instinctive need to worship. There's an instinctive need to pray, to worship. But then the problem is they confuse 
the way of worshipping and who they're worshipping. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets and messengers to guide us. So here Allah speaks about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in Surah Al-Ahzab. Ya ayyuhan nabi, O Prophet, inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa da'iyan wa nadheera ila Allahi bi'idhnih wa sirajan munira. These are the qualities of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. According to the Quran, O Prophet, indeed, we have sent you, inna arsalnaka shahidan. The first is that he is a witness. He's a witness upon his people and all of humanity. Inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran. And the one who bears good news, the one who carries good news. And as a warner, wa da'iyan wa nadheera. A warner to warn people, إِلَى اللَّهِ بِإِذْنِهِ And as one inviting to God by His permission, وَسِرَاجًا munira And as a light giving torch. Rasulullah is a torch where He guides people, where people, they, when they look at His life, when they look at His model of living, they see that He is a role model, a person to follow. So this is the legislative guidance from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Now as far as legislative guidance is concerned, from the first day that man walked on earth, God has never left the earth empty of his representatives who would be a witness to the deeds of men and a bearer of God's knowledge. So why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not leave us just to, with the hidayat taqwiniyyah? with the first type of guidance because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is full of aql. Allah is the all knowledgeable and if Allah is the all knowledgeable therefore Allah is the all just, Allah is adil and this is one of our usul al-deen, the Shia school of thought. We believe that Allah is adil, Allah is just, the other schools of thought they don't have that. They say Allah is knowledgeable. But Allah is just and this is a very important concept, the adala of Allah, the justice. And this is why it is, it's attached to the usul al-deen. You know, they, don't, they, didn't, they didn't attach anything else to the usul al-deen. Out of the qualities of Allah, this is the only one. Because based on the adala of Allah, based on, and this you will, you will learn more about this in the aqa'id class. Based on the adala of Allah, there are many different concepts that arise. For example, the day of judgment. Day of judgment, it goes back to the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah is not just, if Allah doesn't, because others, there are other schools of thought, the Asha'ira, for example, they say that Allah, He declares what is just. For example, on the day of judgment, Allah could, for example, th this is what they say, and we don't agree with this, Allah could take Rasulullah and throw him in the hellfire, and that would be just. Because once He does it, it becomes just. Now, we believe that no, Allah, He's the one who orders us to be just and therefore كَتَبَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ He made justice obligatory upon Himself and therefore He is just. If He's going to order us to be just, He's going to also be just. And, there, and justice and oppression, these are concepts that are built in the fitrah. We know what's justice and what's non-justice. So if the, the ordinary human being who has not even gone to school, knows, can differentiate between justice and oppression. How is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will oppress? Therefore, Allah does not oppress. And based on this, we conclude that there's a day of judgment. We conclude that there are prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if Allah is not just, then he, there is no need to send prophets. But Allah, out of His justice, He sends 124,000 prophets every time had it's prophets and messengers. Ever since Adam, ever since the first human being, there has always been prophets and messengers. And this goes back to the adala of Allah, the justice of Allah. Another concept that is, arises from this, the, the concept of the justice of Allah, which the Shia's, the Shia school of thought argues and is, we strictly adhere to and accept and you know we have to abide by, is the infallibility of the prophets. And this is also, you see a difference with the Shia school of thought and other schools of thought. They say that Rasulullah is not infallible. Only in delivering the message he was infallible. But otherwise, in his day-to-day -day activities, Rasulullah would make mistakes, he would do, do things that are immoral, things that are wrong. And you, you find this in, 
For example, read Bukhari and read Muslim and read uh, these sources, these primary sources of hadith, you find that some of them, they attack the Prophet in a way where when we see non-Muslims attacking the Prophet, we won't be surprised because it was people who were Muslims that attacked the Prophet. And why? This goes back to the concept of not accepting the adala of Allah. Because if you accept the adala of Allah, you're going to have to conclude that Allah, out of His justice, He only sends infallible, infallible prophets. Because if Allah, He expects me to do good, and He sends a prophet who makes mistakes, if the teacher makes mistakes on the Day of Judgment, I could tell Allah, the teacher made a mistake. Why are you expecting me to be perfect? So the teachers don't make mistakes. Because if a teacher makes mistakes, that means the one who sent them also made a mistake. Allah does not make mistakes and Allah is just. Yes, sister. This is a sticking point for me because I can't remember, it's, it's either in 40, number, pardon me, 44 or 48, it, there's, a, there's a, an ayah that said, the person who, who gives his loyalty to Prophet Muhammad is the same as giving his loyalty to, to me, Allah. Okay. To me, that, that it's real clear. Yes. I mean, that says it's infall his infallibility. I mean, if you don't, if you don't put Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him at the, on the highest mm. level. There's a political reason for why they took away the, the infallibility of Prophet Muhammad and the Prophets. And this is because those who came, the establishment that came after the Prophet, they were not infallible. And there were clear mistakes that they would make publicly. So in order to brush off their own mistakes, they came and they attacked the Prophet. And this is a big type of injustice. And then this created a whole movement, a whole school of thought and a whole ideology. But we, because our Imams are infallible as well and they were appointed by Allah. So therefore we hold on to this concept of infallibility. So they pick and choose which, yes, yes. which ones they want to believe in and which bias they... they, they well, they, they could interpret that, like th their opinion is these verses are, could be interpreted in a different way. Yes. So the Sydney School of Thought uh, don't believe that the Prophet was, was infallible? Yes, they say infallible only in delivering the message. That's it, Only when I'm standing on the member, reading the Quran and delivering the message. Other than that, no, at home he would do things that were immoral sometimes. And you go and you read some of these. Yes? Those, uh, that sounds like it came from uh, the Hanbali school of thought, am I right? Hanbali and others, and others which come and... Because Hanbali school of thought, it's a fiqh school of thought. We're talking about ideology. Oh. There's two different things. There's the fiqh schools of thought and then there's the aqa'id school of thought. So we're talking about the aqaid, we're not talking about the fiqh, the jurisprudence. But yes, the hanbali as well, as well included in that. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets out of His justice. This is the whole point that we're trying to get. Allah's yes Habibi. I actually have a question. Yes. Do you mind if I ask Yes. yes. Um, so the revelation, uh, when it came down, did it come down all at once at Laylatul Adr? Or like, we're going to get to this and just... You know, in the next page we're going to get to this, I'll, I'll explain it. There was, type, there was ways in which the revelation was revealed upon the Prophet. And I will, there's the Inzal and the Tanzil and we will, we will point that out. So, as far as the legislative guidance is concerned, from the first day that man walked on earth, God has never left the earth empty of His representative, who would be a witness to the deeds of men and a bearer of God's knowledge. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He expects us to do good, He has to send a teacher. He has to send someone to guide us. In this manner, reportedly 124,000 prophets السلام, were sent in all jointly and successively, many of them bringing divine books or tracts. The final and the most complete message sent by God was through the noblest and the last of His prophets, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He brought a comprehensive religion and the cornerstone of his teachings was the Qur'an. So this is where we come to the Qur'an and this is a, a text regarding the Qur'an. So the cornerstone of the teachings of Rasulullah was the Qur'an. Now what is the Qur'an? Last, a few weeks ago we discussed the names of the Qur'an. You know, if some of you remember one of the names is Tanzil, an, another name is Kitab, Furqan. Um, these are some, Dhikr, the, these are some of the names of the Qur'an. Now, they have, the authors have in order some of the names of the revelation. So the Qur'an has a name 
and the, rev the, re the revealing of the Qur'an it is mentioned in several ways. Sometimes the word wahi is mentioned, another time tanzil, another time inzal, another time qira'a, tilawa, talaqi, ilqa, tartil, ityan, ta'lim. These are all words which describe the revelation that came down upon Rasulullah. And there are various types of revelation that came down upon Rasulullah in various ways. And these all describe the revelation that came down upon Rasulullah. And that revelation, when you compile it, those verses, they make up the Qur'an. They also make up the Qur'an. So the first, the, a, few, a few weeks ago, we were discussing the names of the Qur'an. Now we're discussing the names of the revelation that came down upon Rasulullah So the first, the, so the names of the wahi that came down upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the first is the one that you were asked about, the sending down. Now there's two words to use sending down. The first is inzal and the first and the second is tanzil. And you see that both of these are used. And they have at times they have different meanings and at times they have the similar meanings. So the the term these terms have been used numerously in the Quran. Usually inzal refers to the instantaneous sending down of the Qur'an. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ The whole Qur'an, it came down, it would come down upon the heart of Rasulullah on Laylatul Qadr. And here, scholars point out that there's two types of revelation that came down upon Rasul. The Qur'an would come down in two forms. One form, it would come down gradually over the 23 year period. Every, one, every once in a while, a few verses, a ayah, a, you know, a chapter would come down upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa during that 23 years. This is the Qur'an that the Prophet, when it would come down, he would, re he would recite it to the Muslims. And then there's another type of revelation, which is the inzal, that the Qur'an would come down upon the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Not He wouldn't necessarily recite it to the people, it would just come down, on the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So one, it would come down on the heart of the Prophet, the whole package, and second, one by one, uh, slowly, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, would come down in the form of a wahi, where the Prophet, he would recite it to the Muslims. Yes? So it first came down as the whole Quran into his heart, and then the verses started following after? The, 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 they both happened simultaneously. For example, every Laylatul Qadr, during the, the life of the Prophet, the whole Qur'an would be revealed upon the Prophet. So, Laylatul Qadr. Every 23 years? Yes. The whole Qur'an would be revealed. But then also throughout the 23 years, the parts and par parts of the Qur'an would be revealed upon the Prophet. Uh, so, so uh, yes. is there ayats or surahs that we believe did not make it to the Qur'an? Or whatever God actually brought down to the Prophet, we have it in the Qur'an today? Is there anything missing? No, we believe that the Qur'an, the Qur'an is protected and it's complete. And we mentioned this and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ Allah is protecting the Qur'an. And this is the cornerstone of our belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved the Qur'an unlike the other books prior to the Qur'an. But say, the Qur'an was not collected until the Prophet demise. Yes. So we don't have a confirmation from the Prophet that what we have today is actually what he was listening to the Wahi. Yes, but the Qur'an when it was revealed upon the heart of the Prophet, the Prophet he recited it to hundreds and thousands of people. So it was tawatur. You know, the, the, we've explained this before. There's one person passing down one, another, one thing to another. This is one form, one chain. There is one chain. And then there's tawatur, where there's multiple people, hundreds of people, tens of people. They all say, we heard this. And they pass it down to another group of people, and it was recorded. And then, this is one. Second, Allah has promised it to be, to be preserved. Second, the first is Allah has promised it to be preserved. Second is that it was tawatur. And third is that the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, they didn't, we don't, have, we don't have a hadith where the Imams say, you know, this Qur'an is not, you know, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he memorized the Qur'an. He would memorize it as soon as it would come down. If we don't trust others, at least we trust Amir al-Mu'mineen. The Imams, they all would read the Qur'an the way that it was read by Muslims. And this is one of the miracles of the Qur'an. 
This is considered to be a miracle of the Quran. Yes. Uh, another relevant question, uh, say there's 124,000 prophets. Uh, not all of them are infallible, right? No, we believe that the prophets are infallible. All of them. Yes. All because them. if a prophet he's he's sent by God to teach people. Yeah. If he makes a mistake, people are going to this is a logical reason. You know, there's the asma, the the asma, the infallibility, there are multiple reasons and uh, proofs that you could prove the infallibility. One is a logical reason, which is how could Allah, who expects us to be, per, he's going to hold us accountable, how could he send someone who makes mistakes? And then he also expects us, uh, he's going to hold us accountable whether we did right or wrong. This is the logical reason. And the second reason is we have multiple, from the verses of the Quran and from the hadith, la yanalu ahdi al and we have all other verses of the Quran and uh, sources of hadith from the Imams, from Imam al rida for example, from the Imams. They come in and they explain every single, even though this is going off topic, they explain, for example, Adam disobeyed, when, where Allah says, Asa Adam Rabba, where Yunus, he did, the, he did several things. The Imam, he comes and he explains the story where he explains it in a way where, no, it was not disobeying. For example, Adam, one example, he, one, one where when he ate from the tree, Adam wasn't even on earth at that time, where there was no halal or haram. It was just a, a guidance. It was just an advice. Like a, your doctor tells you, don't smoke. If you smoke, you're not going to be health. You're not going to be healthy. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells him, don't eat from the tree. If you eat from the tree, you're going to go, you're going to go to earth. That so it's not haram and halal yet. And we believe that all the prophets of Allah are infallible. Yes, yes, yeah. They didn't burn the Quran, no. The hadith was burnt. This, this evangelical person, is, he's confused and he's trying to confuse other people. They gathered, the, during the time of the first two Khalifas, they gathered all of the hadith. The Quran, no one burned the Quran. I, I thought the way I heard it, uh, as far as what Osman did, he collected all the versions, he asked for all the versions of the Quran. Yes. And the ones that matched, they kept or as a version of the Quran. But the ones that deviated from the Quran, these are the ones he burned. Yes, they, they, stand, they, they made sure that everything was, was accurate and then they, they, public, they sent mass copies. So for example, they sent one, one copy to Egypt, one copy to Iraq, one copy to these areas. Anything that was different, which was not Quran, Anything that people thought was Qur'an, but it wasn't Qur'an, that they got rid of. But the Qur'an was not burnt. The actual Qur'an was not burnt. And the Qur'an has been protected throughout time. So, the names, the names of the Qur'an, the names of the revelation, the first is Inzal and Tanzil. So, Inzal, it means coming down all at once, instantaneous. And then there's Tanzil. Tanzil, which means the gradual Dissension of the Quran, the gradual revelation. Allah says in the Quran, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ نَزَّلَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ So the Quran, it would come down gradually. It would come down gradually. And then they, they point out that, however, this is not always the case because the two terms have been used interchangeably. So sometimes the word inzal and tanzil were used in, for the same meaning. So in one verse, Yunus uh, 10.20 And they say, why is a sign not sent? Using the word unzil, which is all at once, to him from his Lord. And you see another verse, which is Al-An'am 6.37 And they say, why has a sign not been sent? Using the word nuzil, which is gradual, down to him from his Lord. So they point out that the better distinction between the two terms is that inzal, which is the inzal, refers to the sending down of the Quran, either instantaneously or gradually, in single verses or whole passages, while tanzil refers to the constant revelation of the Quran. It's constantly 
coming down upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So this is one, one word that is used, inzal and tanzil. Another word that is used in the Quran is ilqa or talaqi and that is infusion where it would come down upon the Prophet, it would be infused upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The term ilqa means to infuse and talaqi means to receive. So Rasulullah used to do the talaqi, he used to receive the Quran, the heart of Rasulullah used to receive the Quran and Allah would do the ilqa process, the infusion process. So infusion um, means to receive and therefore in the Quran the terms refer to the infusion of guidance into the Prophet's heart and the receiving of this guidance by him. The following are two examples. Inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. This is in Surah Al-Muzzammil. Ya ayyuhal muzzammil qum al-layla illa qalila. Inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. We will infuse, and using the word sanulqi, you with a weighty word. Now this is one. In another time you see وَإِنَّكَ لَتُلَقَّ الْقُرْآنَ مِنْ لَدٌ حَكِيمٍ عَلِيمٍ And indeed you are made to receive tulaqqa al-Qur'an from the wise and the all-knowing. So this is one word for the revelation. Another word, the third word is qira'ah and tilawah. Qira'ah and tilawah, reading or recital. The term qira'ah has been used four times in the Qur'an. For example, سَنُقْرِئُكَ فَلَا تَنْسَى We will bring down the... We will bring down the wahi, but the word qira'ah is used. And in the other one, الناس سنلقي, we will infuse. So it's not always, we will awhayna, it's not always the word wahi or inzal is used. Sometimes different words are used. And this is because each one has its own specific meaning. And this is for those who go and look at the tafsir of the Qur'an. Why does Allah, for example, in this verse, He uses the word sanuqri'uka instead of Nunazil. You know, each one has its own meaning. You have to go and look at the tafsir. You have to go and look at what the what the scholars say for what what's the whole purpose behind this. Yes. So uh, Allah is speaking to the Prophet when he tells him we will make you read, right? Yes. Um, so this would be what to use against the argument that the Prophet was alone. Well, I mentioned what qira'a meant last time, you know, there, there's different meanings for qira'a, but yes, one of them is to read. But the Prophet, the Prophet, he, he was not ummi, but the Prophet also did not go and learn from anyone else. As the Qur'an will, will, will point out that the Prophet, he learned from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the teacher of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa سَنُقْرِئُكَ فَلَا تَنْسَى We will make you read. While the term tilawa has been used six times in the Qur'an, for example, تِلْكَ آيَاتُ اللَّهِ نَتْلُوهَا عَلَيْكَ بِالْحَقِّ the, the word نَتْلُوهَا is used. And this is Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 252. وَإِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ So these are the communications, the, the ayat of Allah, we recite them, نَتْلُوهَا to you with the truth. Both terms mean reading or recital. However, while qira'a can mean reading any text, qira'a means any, any, any book, could, you could use the word qira'a, but tilawa is usually confined to reading divine scriptures. So tilawa is specific and exclusive to divine scriptures and specifically the Qur'an. Now there's another, ver another word and that is tartil. And you know when we recite the Qur'an, you recite it in the, in the correct form, that is called tartil. This term refers to the recital of the words of the Qur'an separately and in a measured, sty measured style. The tartil, it means you're, when, you, when someone, he does tartil of the Qur'an, it's not just, some, or tajweed, it's not just someone who's reciting in a nice voice. Some of us, we think that the one who is a mujawid or murattil, this person just recites in a nice voice. No. There's a, a deeper meaning, a more important meaning for that, and that is reciting it correctly, knowing where to stop, when to, when to, that is the most important thing, because you're reading a message, and the message, in order for it to be delivered correctly, you have to read it correctly, for it to be to understood correctly. So that 
it has an effect on the hearts of the listeners. If it's read correctly, it will have an effect on the hearts of the listeners. It has been used in the Quran to describe both the style of the revelation. So tartil, it's used to reveal the style of the revelation on the hearts of Rasulullah and as well as the recommended style of recital. So the first one, the style of re revelation, كَذَلِكَ لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ وَرَتَّلْنَاهُ تَرْتِيلًا Thus, we may strengthen your heart by it and we have recited it on you in a measured recital. The measured recital, the way that it came down, it, the word tartil was used. وَرَتَّلْنَاهُ And the second verse, it's referring to how we should recite the Qur'an and we should also recite it in the measured recital. We should recite it in the correct form. وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا When you recite the Qur'an, recite it according to its rules. Don't just read it like you read any book. You have to know where to stop. When to, when to, you have to read it correctly for the meaning to be understood correctly. So this is the fourth. The fifth is ityan or ita, And this is bestowal or a giving. So these, these terms meaning granting or bestowing, etyan and ita means giving and bestowing have been used ten times in the Qur'an. The following two examples illustrate the use of both derivatives. In one verse Allah says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِي وَالْقُرْآنِ الْعَظِيمِ And we have given you, we have granted you using the word آتَيْنَاك. So etyan, it's a type of revelation. And another one, and another one, بَلْ أَتَيْنَاهُمْ بِذِكْرِهِمْ فَهُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِهِمْ مُعْرَضُونَ Nay, we have bestowed upon them or to them, أَتَيْنَاهُمْ Their reminder, but from their reminder they turn aside. لَقَدْ أَتَيْنَاهُمْ We had given them a reminder, but they rejected the reminder. Speaking about the kuffar. The sixth is the word, the use of the word تَعْلِيم so a revelation, it could come down through giving, through tartil, through qira'ah, through talawa, ilqa, talaqi, and once is ta'lim, educating and instructing. وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ And what does this mean? This means this term has been used with its derivatives four times in the Qur'an and indicates that the Prophet learned only from God. This is the difference. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he learned. يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Rasulullah, for those who say the Prophet was ummi, the Prophet did not know how to read. This is, the Prophet, he's the, he's the greatest teacher. He was the one who's teaching them. And Allah says, يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He's the one that teaches them. But who is his teacher? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the difference. The Prophet did not go to a school like you and I. The Prophet did not, was not educated by any other person other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ And he has instructed you using the word عَلَّمَكَ through a revelation, through a wahi about what you did not know. So this is also one. Seventh, qas, which is a narration. So the seventh form is through a narration. This is another meaning for uh, revelation. This term is usually used in the Qur'an when it narrates stories and parables. For example, when the story of Yusuf is narrated. نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ We narrate نَقُص It's a type of revelation, but it's through a narrate, narrative form. نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ To you the best narratives by our revealing, by our wahi, to you in this Qur'an. So these words, every single one of them, it refers to a specific dimension or aspect of the Qur'an. One aspect of the Qur'an it has stories, but it's not all a book of stories. So therefore there are qasas in the Qur'an. There is ta'lim in the Qur'an, there are instructions in the Qur'an. There is bestowal, there's parts of measure, measured recital. Every, there are many features in the Qur'an and this is what makes the Qur'an such a great book is that it cannot be limited to just one understanding. There, that's why it has multiple names. Even the revelations has multiple names because it's not a, you can't just accept the book in one way. There's many dimensions and features to the Qur'an and it's in fact it's a living book. So therefore it's a, it's, it, continues to change and the meanings continue to change and therefore we have to adapt to the Qur'an. 
We have to constantly adapt to the many features of the Quran. The eighth is obligation. This term, fard, this term means making compulsory and binding. It is frequently employed for the obligatory acts of worship, such as the daily prayers. So the obligatory acts of worship, they are fard upon us. They are obligatory upon us. However, the Quran is also the 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 rev revelation of the Quran. This word is also used in the Quran. It refers to the obligation of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to recite the verses and spread God's messages. Message: Inna alladhi farad alayk al Quran la raduk ila maad. This verse came down when the Prophet was leaving Mecca during his migration. When he was leaving Mecca, Rasulullah, he looked back and he began to cry. He had his, his eyes began to tear because he had to leave his hometown. He had to leave the city that he was born in. The city that he, he the only city he knew, Mecca, for the sake of Islam, for the sake of the religion. So once he was leaving at the age of 53, imagine you have to migrate at that age. The Prophet had to leave his town because they were persecuting him because of the message that he it was obligatory upon him to deliver. So this verse came down in Surah Al-Qasas, chapter 28, verse 85. Most surely he, he who has made the Qur'an fard, obligatory, compulsory upon you, meaning that you have to deliver the message of the Qur'an, will bring you back to your promised destination. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet when he is leaving Mecca, that the one who made the Qur'an wajib, obligatory upon you to deliver, will bring you back to your town. Don't worry, you're, you're eventually going to come back. And this was a great promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he had hope that he will, and he had faith that he will come back to Mecca after being kicked out and after he has to escape for his life from Mecca. Another word, the ninth word, and there's 10 that are used. The ninth word is Maji. وَلَقَدْ جَاءَهُمْ Coming. وَلَقَدْ جَاءَهُمْ مِنْ رَبِّهُمُ الْهُدَى مِنْ رَبِّهُمُ الْهُدَى And certainly the guidance has come to them. Maji, using the word come. So the Qur'an came in a way. It has come, the guidance has come to them to, from their Lord. This term has been used over 35 times in the Qur'an with different derivatives. Sometimes it refers to guidance coming down to the people as above, and other times it is used to guidance coming to the Prophet. So sometimes the Majid, like in this verse, it came to the people. When Allah sends Prophets to people, Allah says, the guidance came to them. And then sometimes it came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ عَمَّا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ and do not pay heed to their low desires to turn away from the truth, but judge between them by what has come to you, Ja'ak. The revelation has come to you. And the final, the tenth, is Wahi, the revelation, the use of the word Wahi, which we started off our discussion with. And as we mentioned, Wahi has very, for the four meanings of Wahi that were pointed out, وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ Allah tells the Prophet, and certainly it has been revealed, أُوحِيَ The revelation has come to you and to those before you. This basic term for legislative guidance has been used over 70 times in the Qur'an with various derivatives such as أَوْحَى sometimes يُوحَى sometimes أَوْحَيْنَا and etc. Because we have a special interest in this term, it will be described more fully in the next two sections. So later on, they're going to come and explain exactly what is wahi and how it comes down and what differentiates it between between ilham and wahi and uh, ilham is inspiration and the forms of communication, the forms of wahi that would come down upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين